we have to, to understand this. Uh, I have the pleasure to start the uh, Novartis uh, Symposium, Novartis Oncology Symposium. And actually, our topic today is somewhat hard. We are not seeing too much in our clinical practice, which is neuroendocrine tumors, management of neuroendocrine tumors. I do admire that my co-chairman and our distinguished speaker, Professor Nadia Mukhtar, is considered as the best one probably in the region to give us a synopsis about the pathology, the origin, and the classification, and what we are expecting to have from a pathology report from a case of neuroendocrine tumor. Professor Nadia Mukhtar is a known uh, professor of uh, pathology in the National Cancer Institute, Cairo University, and <clears throat> I have the honor to introduce her as a professor from whom I learned a lot. Professor Nadia. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the nice introduction. And it's always a pleasure to uh, participate in prestigious conferences uh, carried out by Dr. Hisham Al Ghazali. Uh, it's also my pleasure to uh, address this uh, prestigious audience uh, together with uh, prestigious uh, professors. Uh, as Dr. Mohammed Abdullah mentioned, my talk will be about the neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we really need to understand the concept the pathology, the immunology, the molecular behavior, so that we can all speak the same language and give the patient the right treatment. First of all, what is the neuroendocrine system? As the name implies, it is the intermediary between the endocrine cells and the nerve impulse. It's very important to get this connection so that the body speaks one language. The location, it's all over the body especially in certain areas where the need is higher, and this is in the lungs and or the respiratory system and the gastrointestinal tract. The function is to, to do some sort of regulation of the amount of air that passes through the blood or the lungs, or to control the, the speed at which food is moved through the gastrointestinal tract. This uh, sort of regulation is very important so that the body keeps still at a very constant state. So therefore, the corresponding tumors will also be uh, uh, appreciated in these areas, namely in the gastrointestinal tract as well as in the respiratory tract. So the outline of my talk will be just a, a quick presentation of some epidemiologic data as presented to our uh, pathology department at NCI, and then the pathologic classification and immunohistochemistry, which should be an integral part of the diagnosis of any neuroendocrine tumor. At our department, we have done this uh, sort of a study in which we collected all cases of neuroendocrine tumors, and we noticed that there is a, 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 an annual increase sort of roughly annual increase in the relative frequency of neuroendocrine tumors uh, from the year 2000 till the year 2009. So why is this a true increase or because we know better about this disease or we have more uh, tests that can, uh, that can really uh, assure us that the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor? I think that it is the, uh, all three elements put together. There might be, uh, although this is not uh, quite uh, proved, there might be true increase in the incidence, but definitely we know more about the disease, the biology, and the molecular pathogenesis, as well as many good markers for precise diagnosis. The SEER data states that the digestive system tumors is far more than the respiratory system tumors. Uh, mostly in the ileum, then the rectum, the colon, the stomach, the appendix, and so on. But however, our data speaks a little bit different in which we see that our cases show more of colorectal presentation than the pan pan pancreatic biliary system, the small intestine, and then the anal canal. Of course, the liver or the uh, peritoneal uh, implants are secondaries, so we do not uh, indicate that as primary site. And this also shows us that the neuroendocrine tumors in our material usually come in a metastatic phase uh, quite late. 
classification it has been put forward by the WHO in conjunction with the European Euroendocrine Tumor Society. This was out in 2010. And it's very important to follow this classification because the nomenclature by which we write in the pathology uh, report should be understood by oncologists uh, uh, in the clinic. It is subdivided into well-differentiated and poorly differentiated, and they are very much quite segregated. The well-differentiated will be further subdivided into low grade or grade one, and an intermediate grade or grade two, judged by the uh, amount of mitosis that the tumor carries. If less than two per 10 high power field, that is grade one, and it forms the classic carcinoid or islet cell pancreatic tumor, and the nomenclature should be that that is what will be written in the pathology report, neuroendocrine tumor, grade one. If the mitosis is a little bit higher, two to 20 per 10 high power field microscopy, then we're talking about atypical carcinoid or what we call neuroendocrine tumor, grade two. On the very end of the scale down there is a different uh, disease which is poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Here the mitosis is very high. We see sometimes mitosis uh, more than 30 or 50 per 10 high power field, and that puts the diagnosis of either small cell carcinoma or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So the, state, the, the word carcinoma here is starting to appear. Neuroendocrine carcinoma grade three, small cell type, or neuroendocrine carcinoma grade three, large cell type. Also, the classification can use the percent positivity of KI67, which is a known proliferating marker. Whether you use uh, uh, mitosis or KI67 proliferation, it, it, this is not important. What's important is that you should put at the end the nomenclature of the tumor. And how would we like to, say, translate from the language of the mitosis to the language of the KI67? Very simply, one mitotic count equals 6% KI67. If we look at this, for example, area, only one mitosis, but of course we have here six KI67 count, and this is simply because the uh, mitosis is one stage of the cell cycle, while KI67 counts all the stages of the proliferating cell cycle, namely G1, S, and G2 phases, and mitosis, of course. This is some beautiful uh, photos from the world of pathology. Grade one uh, carcinoid tumor or neuroendocrine tumor, grade one, well differentiated, very easy to diagnose. Any pathologist in the room would just give it a spot diagnosis. And here we seldom see any mitotic figures, less than two per 10 high power field microscopy. If we go up higher, we see more mitosis and this is neuroendocrine tumor grade two, mitosis two to 20 per 10 high power field microscopy. Now large cell uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma, if you look at this tumor, it just resembles any undifferentiated tumor anywhere. So you really need to prove that it is of neuroendocrine origin and this is definitely by immunohistochemistry. But small cell carcinoma is very much indicative or suggestive of neuroendocrine origin, but still we have to do confirmatory neuroendocrine uh, markers. So, so the carcinoma is either a large cell type or small cell type. If you suspect for some reason that the patient might be of neuroendocrine disease, then with the large cell undifferentiated carcinoma, again, we have to do the, our immunohistochemical markers. Is it important to grade? Definitely it is, because roughly speaking, uh, it is two subtypes of diseases or two disease categories. Those that are lumped as grade one and two on one end of the scale and the other end of the scale, the scale shows the grade three tumors and the survival is very much different. For example, this is a neuroendocrine tumor grade two and this is a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma in which one is well differentiated, favorable prognosis, hormone syndromes are usually uh, associated, while on the other hand, the, the poorly differentiated tumors are fast growing, they have bad prognosis, and possibly no hormone syndrome, or much less. So, 
what about the relation between these two diseases? Would that uh, disease convert to this one? And the answer is definitely no. Low-grade tumors will behave uh, low-grade all the time, even if they metastasize. They will still become grade one or grade one and two, but they will not convert to be a small cell carcinoma of grade three, two different diseases. And we can have a mix of both, a mix of epithelial and neuroendocrine in the same tumor, but you have to have at least 30% of each component in the tumor to call the tumor as mixed. And of course, this is to be confirmed by immunohistochemistry as well. The neuroendocrine tumors have this uh, sort of habit to present more with metastasis, and the metastasis could be of very large uh, size, appreciable size, and the primary may not be very well detected or very small in appearance. If you can see here, this is a very small ileal tumor with a huge lymph node metastasis and also liver metastasis. And the disease is secreting serotonin, so the patient is having the syndrome while the primary tumor is still very small. Pancreatic tumors could be either small or large, and it is important for the gross pathologist to measure precisely the size of the pancreatic tumor because size matters. You see here that the, uh, if tumors are below two centimeters, they carry a much, much favorable prognosis. Immunohistochemistry, and it is very important. It has never been more important in any other tumor because it will categorize the patient into some certain disease that needs a very special treatment. So uh, an underlying uh, statement is all cases suspected to be uh, neuroendocrine tumors should undergo immunohistochemistry for confirmation, even if the morphology is very much appreciated. What is the role of immunohistochemistry? We have so many types of markers that we can use for different reasons. First of all, and the most important, is diagnostic markers. We have three main markers, chromogranin, synaptophysine, and neuron-specific enolase. We'll talk in detail about each one. We can also know from the immunohistochemical marker the hormonal status, whether this tumor secretes insulin, gastrin, and so on. Or if we have a metastasis and we do not know the primary, as we mentioned, it, it usually does so. So we, we can apply markers also to detect the primary. Islet-1 markers uh, indicates pancreas, while CDX2 uh, in, in, uh, denotes intestinal origin. And we use CDX2 quite a lot, as well as cytokeratin-7. Prognostically, we talked about the KI-67 and how it can uh, limit the uh, prognostic profile of the, um, of the tumor. And lastly, the therapy guidance and response uh, now we're talking about the somatostatin receptors and how we can apply markers to detect somatostatin receptors in the tumor. Chromogranin, first diagnostic marker. You see here many examples. Colonic net, positive. Pancreatic net is also positive in the neuroendocrine category, not the epithelial one. Also, if we have a very small metastasis in the liver, it will pick up this metastasis, and of course the carcinoid, classic carcinoid of the appendix is very strongly positive for chromogranin. Sometimes chromogranin is a bit weak, and we result then to another marker, which is superior, the synaptophysin. When some tumors are not very positive and we're not sure, we use synaptophysin, and sometimes, just to cut the time short, we use them both together and see the result. Here again is another neuroendocrine tumor, but the uh, positivity is quite weak. Chromogranin has this um, disadvantage. One tumor was totally negative and was tremendously positive for synaptophysin. So uh, I'd really advocate that uh, for, for, for pathology, uh, lab quality control, chromogranin, synaptophysin, either done together or preferably synaptophysin. Small cell tumors as well as large cell tumors will both be strongly positive for synaptophysin. A very good marker indeed. And why is that? 
because synaptophysin represents the small synaptic vesicle that is always present in the cell. It does not discharge outside the cell. While the chromogranin represents or is positive in the membrane protein of the neurosecretory granule. If the cell discharges its granules, it will be deficient in neurosecretory granules, but the synapto, uh, uh, synaptic vesicle will always be there on its own, and the vesicle could go out. And of course, you know that the peptide hormone, again, is present in the neurosecretory granule. Chromogranin, as well as the peptide hormone, they can be secreted into the serum. So if you're talking about following your patient, increased level or decreased level, we never use synaptophysin because it never leaves the cell. Neuron-specific enolase, as the name does not imply, it's not specific, but it's sometimes sensitive enough in very undifferentiated tumors. So if the tissue is discharging its neurosecretory granule in the serum, the, the level in this tissue is diminished while the level in the serum will increase. More markers that we can use, adhesion molecules, intermediate filaments, or HASH1 new nuclear marker, very reliable in cases of very scanty material when uh, both other markers are not uh, very much uh, informative. Example, I'm just going to show you quick two cases uh, presented to us at the Department of Pathology at NCI. Male patient, he is 56 years, and he had this mass in his pancreas, and he was diagnosed in 2008 as tumor with neuroendocrine features. We're not, we were not sure for immunohistochemistry. And this is the synaptophysin, quite strong, quite indicative. Also, we uh, tried the HASH1, which I mentioned it's a new nuclear marker. Uh, nuclear markers have this favor of being uh, very specific, no non-specific reaction, and quite sensitive and uh, indicative. Uh, Ki67 was 11 per 10 high power field, so that puts that tumor in the category of neuroendocrine tumor grade 2. Another core biopsy of a retroperitoneal mass. She was a, a, a young lady. Uh, of course, we were not sure whether this is a guest or a sarcoma or whatever, the cell's looking very spindly, but again, synaptophysin and chromogranin, as well as cytokeratin and neuron-specific enolase were all positive, so that gave us the answer straight away. Sensitivity and specificity. Both the, um, the chromogranin and synaptophysin are quite specific, but we mentioned that synapto is more sensitive. Neuron-specific enolase, we only use it when we are really desperate. By electromicroscopy, very, uh, if you use that kind of a complicated uh, equipment, uh, you see the electron-dense secretory granules very, very evident. The pancreatic tumors, the well-differentiated, can either be functional or non-functional. The most uh, frequent tumor of the functional group is, of course, the insulinoma, while the non-functional is the microadenoma, and this is an example of a small insinolioma. However, these cases present themselves clinically, uh, despite the fact that the tumor may be very small and you cannot see it. But the clinical picture will be very evident, zollinger ellison syndrome. Uh, malignancy, again, could be functional or non-functional or mixed. We see a lot of mixed tumors in the pancreas in particular. Last marker is the somatostatin. The somatostatin receptors in neuroendocrine tumors makes that cell avid for hormone, and that is why it, uh, the, the uptake of hormone is strong. It does that through what is called the somatostatin receptor. So this marker is, all, is, is both of diagnostic as well as uh, um, for therapeutic or targeted therapy uh, reasons. And this is an example of a strong positive uh, receptor for somatostatin. SS2, there are so many types, but I'm just confined to this particular uh, marker in which uh, metastasis of the, um, in the liver is positive for somatostatin, and this makes this patient amenable to targeted therapy. So, lastly, when to test for neuroendocrine tumors? Definitely, we might have a clinical presentation. Of course, it's not always the case. 
neuroendocrine patients may not present by uh, neuroendocrine syndrome, but if there is, it will definitely help. Also, if you have a large tumor or a small tumor, but with bulky metastasis, but the patient is generally in good condition, you should always think of neuroendocrine tumor. Topography, yes. Appendix and small intestine and the intrabronchial are the most specific or the most uh, uh, vulnerable areas for neuroendocrine tumors, and usually they are of the low-grade types. Pancreas, only 30%. And lastly, the histopathology. If we have a carcinoid feature, which is small cells that are nested, no mitosis, vascular stroma, then we can suspect and go for immuno. Any small cell element in any carcinoma, then we would like to know whether it is a mixed tumor or if there is a, an element of neuroendocrine nature. And lastly, if there is an adenocarcinoma, again, with a small cell component, we would like also but, but for a golden rule, any tumor that is suspected to be neuroendocrine tumor, immuno has to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nadia, for your uh, comprehensive, elegant uh, co coverage as usual. I think uh, the floor is open for one or two questions. Dr. Gamal, it's for the Libya. Dr. Gamal, I'm here. Hormonal or symptoms like carcinoid or insulinomas. Yes. The other groups. Is there any benefit to differentiate, or has this any reflection? The reflection would be, therapy? of course, on the therapy, <laughs> because oncologists would like to know how to proceed with therapy. Are they neuroendocrine? Are they going to respond uh, regarding targeted therapy or not? And also, it gives an effect on prognosis. In neuroendocrine tumors, if low grade, this really indicates a much better prognosis than uh, carcinoma grade 2, for example. So yes, in terms of prognosis and therapy, it is important to learn about the neuroendocrine niche. You can differentiate uh, a tumor like a carcinoid or yes. gastrinoma or whatever yes. without the clinical symptoms, I mean? Uh, morphologically, yes. I said there are morphologic hints mm. that, we can, uh, that we can diagnose by, but as a rule, never to, confer, to, to, to put the final uh, diagnosis except after the immune histochemical markers. But yes, carcinoid, it's very, very easy. We used to uh, diagnose carcinoid a long time ago and with no immune histochemistry, and it was correct. But nowadays, because we have the immuno and because of the targeted therapy, which is expensive, and so we have to document by markers. Because sometimes we have neuroendocrine tumors only in the pathology, and that the patient has no symptoms yeah, at all. Yeah, many, many, tu many tumors are non-functional. It's, it's known. It's, it's a fact. Yeah. Uh, but particularly the tumors of the four gut, they yes. are not functioning at all. Yes. And the bronchial and the, the, the stomach, yeah. Uh, yes, so we will have to uh, uh, take a t tissue diagnosis and do immunohistochemistry for all cases, yeah. That's Thank right. you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nadia, for this very, very uh, intelligent and beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, and I have now the honor to introduce uh, one of the pioneers for medical oncology, Professor Muhammad Abdullah. He uh, gave us a talk about the medical oncology approach in management of uh, multidisciplinary management of neuroendocrine tumor. Professor Muhammad.